Chapter Thirty of Colonel Quaritch, V.C. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Colonel Quaritch, V.C. by H. Ryder Haggart. Chapter Thirty. Harold takes the news. Mr. Quest and Harold bore the bleeding man, whether he was senseless or dead, they knew not, into the house and laid him on the sofa. Then, having dispatched a servant to seek a second doctor in case the one already gone for was out, they set to work to cut the clothes from his neck and arm and do what they could, and that was little enough toward staunching the bleeding. It soon, however, became evident that Cosy had only got the outside portion of the charge of number seven, that is to say, that he had been struck by about a hundred pellets out of the three hundred or so which would go into the ordinary ounce and an eighth. Had he received the whole charge, he must at that distance have been instantly killed. As it was, the point of the shoulder was riddled, and so, to a somewhat smaller extent, was the back of his neck and the region of the right ear. One or two outside pellets had also struck the head higher up, and the skin and muscles along the back were torn by the passage of the shot. By Jove, said Mr. Quest, I think he's done for. The colonel nodded. He had had some experience of shot wounds, and the present was not of a nature to encourage hope of the patient's survival. How did it happen? asked Mr. Quest presently, as he mopped up the streaming blood with a sponge. It was an accident, groaned the colonel. Your wife was looking at my new gun. I told her that it was loaded and that she must be careful, and I thought she had put it down. The next thing that I heard was the report. It is all my cursed fault for leaving the cartridges in. Ah, said Mr. Quest, she always thought that she understood guns. It is a shocking accident. Just then one of the doctors came running up the lawn, carrying a box of instruments, and followed by Bella Quest, and in another minute was at work. He was a quick and skillful surgeon, and having announced that the patient was not dead, at once set to work to tie one of the smaller arteries in the throat, which had been pierced and through which Edward Cossey was rapidly bleeding to death. By the time that this was done, the other doctor, an older man, put in an appearance, and together they made a rapid examination of the injuries. Bella stood by, holding a basin of water. She did not speak, and on her face was that same fixed look of horror which Harold had observed after the discharge of the gun. When the examination was finished, the two doctors whispered together for a few seconds. "'Will he live?' asked Mr. Quest. "'We well, cannot say,' answered the older doctor. "'We do not think it probable that he will. "'It will depend upon the extent of the injuries, "'and whether or no they have extended to the spine. "'If he does live, he will probably be paralyzed to some extent, "'and he will certainly lose the hearing of the right ear.' "'When she heard this, Bella sank down upon a chair, overwhelmed, "'and then the two doctors, assisted by Harold, set to work to carry Edward Cossey into another room, which had been rapidly prepared, leaving Mr. Quest alone with his wife. He came and stood in front of her, and looked her in the face, and then laughed. "'Upon my word,' he said, "'we men are bad enough, but you women beat us in wickedness.' "'What do you mean?' she said faintly. "'I mean that you are a murderess, Bella,' he said solemnly, "'and you are a bungler, too.' "'You could not hold the gun straight.' "'I deny it,' she said. "'The gun went off.' "'Yes,' he said. "'You are wise to make no admissions. "'They might be used in evidence against you. "'Let me counsel you to make no admissions. "'But now look here. "'I suppose that this man will have to lie in this house "'until he recovers or dies, "'and that you will help to nurse him. "'Well, I will have none of your murderous work going on here. "'Do you hear me? "'You are not to complete at leisure.' "'which you have begun in haste.' "'What do you take me for?' she asked, with some return of spirit. "'Do you think that I would injure a wounded man?' "'I do not know,' he answered with a shrug. "'And as for what I take you for, I take you for a woman whose passion has made her mad.' And he turned and left the room. When they had got Edward Cossey, dead or alive, and looked more like death than life, up to the room prepared for him, the colonel, seeing that he could be of no further use, left him, with a view of going at once to the castle. On his way out, he looked into the drawing-room, and there was Mrs. Quest, 
still sitting on the chair and gazing blankly before her. Pitying her, he entered. Come, cheer up, Mrs. Quest, he said kindly. They hope that he will live. She made no answer. It is an awful accident, but I am almost as culpable as you, for I left the cartridges and the gun. Anyhow, God's will be done. God's will, she said, looking up, and then once more relapsed into silence. He turned to go, when suddenly she rose and caught him by the arm. Will he die? she said, almost fiercely. Tell me what you think, not what the doctors say. You have seen lots of wounded men, and you know better than they do. Tell me the truth. I cannot say, he answered, shaking his head. Apparently she interpreted his answer as yes. At any rate, she covered her face with her hands. What would you do, Colonel Quaritch, if you had killed the only one thing you loved in the whole world? She asked presently. Oh, what am I saying? I am off my head. Leave me and go and tell Ida. It will be good news for Ida. Accordingly, having picked up the gun from the spot where it had fallen from the hands of Mrs. Quest, he started for the castle. And then it was that for the first time there flashed upon his mind the extraordinary importance of this dreadful accident in its bearing upon his own affairs. If Cosy died, he could marry Ida, that was clear. That was what Mrs. Quest must have meant when she said that it would be good news for Ida. But how did she know anything about Ida's engagement to Edward Cosy? And by Jove, what did the woman mean when she asked what he would do if he had killed the only one thing he loved in the world? Cosy must be the only thing she loved. And now he thought of it, when she believed that he was dead, she called him Edward, Edward. Now Harold Quaritch was as simple and unsuspicious a man as it would be easy to find, but he was no fool. He had moved about the world, and on various occasions come in contact with cases of this sort, as most other men have done. He knew that when a woman, in a moment of distress, calls a man by his Christian name, it is because she is in the habit of thinking of him and speaking of him by that name. Not that there is much in that by itself, but in public she called him Mr. Cosy. Edward, clearly then, was the only thing she loved, and Edward was secretly engaged to Ida, and Mrs. Quest knew it. Now when a man has the fortune, or rather the misfortune, to be the only thing a married woman ever loved, and when that married woman is aware of the fact of his devotion and engagement to somebody else, it is obvious, he reflected, that in nine cases out of ten the knowledge will excite strong feelings in her breast, feelings, indeed, which in some nature would amount almost to madness. When he had first seen Mrs. Quest that afternoon, she and Cosy were alone together, and he had noticed something unusual about her something unnatural and intense. Indeed, he had, he remembered, told her that she looked like a tragic muse. Could it be that the look was the look of a woman, maddened by insult and jealousy, who was meditating some fearful crime? How did that gun go off? He did not see it, and he thanked God that he did not, for somehow we are not always as anxious to bring our fellow creatures to justice as we might be especially when they happen to be young and lovely women. How did it go off? She understood guns. He could see that from the way she handled it. Was it likely that it exploded of itself, or owing to an accidental touch of the trigger? It was possible, but not likely. Still, such things had been known to happen, and it would be impossible to prove that it had not happened in this case. If it was an attempted murder, it was very cleverly managed because nobody could prove that it was not accidental. But could it be that that soft, beautiful, baby-faced woman had, on the spur of the moment, taken advantage of his loaded gun to wreak her jealousy and her wrongs upon her faithless lover? Well, the face is no mirror of the quality of the soul within, and it was possible. Further than that, it did not seem to him to be his business to inquire. By this time he was at the castle. The squire was out, but Ida was in, and he was shown into the drawing-room while the servant went to seek her. Presently he heard her dress rustle upon the stairs, and the sound of it sent the blood to his heart, for where is the music that is more sweet than the rustling of the dress of the woman whom we love? 
she came in and shook hands with him. Why, what is the matter? she said, noticing the disturbed expression on his face. Well, he said, there has been an accident, a very bad accident. Who? she said. Not my father? No, no, Mr. Cossey. Oh, she said with a sigh of relief. Why did you frighten me so? The colonel smiled grimly at this unconscious exhibition of the relative state of her affections. What has happened to him? asked Ida, this time with a suitable expression of concern. He has been accidentally shot. By whom? Mrs. Quest. Then she did it on purpose. I mean, is he dead? No, but I believe he will die. They looked at each other, and each read in the eyes of the other the thought which passed through their brain. If Edward Cossey died, they would be free to marry. So clearly did they read it that Ida actually interpreted it in words. You must not think that, she said. It is very wrong. It is wrong, answered the colonel, apparently in no way surprised at her interpretation of his thought. But unfortunately, human nature is human nature. Then he went on to tell her all about it. Ida made no comment, that is, after those first words. She did it on purpose, which burst from her in her astonishment. She felt, and he felt too, that the question as to how that gun went off was one which was best left uninquired into by them. No doubt if the man died there would be an inquest, and the whole matter would be investigated. Meanwhile one thing was certain. Edward Cossey, whom she was engaged to, was shot and likely to die. Presently, while they were still talking, the squire came in from his walk, and to him also the story was told, and to judge from the expression of his face, he thought it a serious one enough. If Edward Cossey died, the mortgages over the Honham property would, as he thought, of course pass to his heir, who, unless he had made a will, which was not probable, would be his father, old Mr. Cossey, the banker, from whom Mr. de la Mole well knew he had little mercy to expect. This was serious enough, and what was still more serious was that all the bright prospects in which he had for some days been basking of the re-establishment of his family upon a securer basis than it had occupied for generations would vanish like a vision. Now he was not more worldly-minded than other men, but he did most fondly cherish the natural desire to see the family fortunes once more in the ascendant. The projected marriage between his daughter and Edward Cossey would have most fully brought this work about, and however much he might in his secret heart distrust the man himself and doubt whether the match was really acceptable to Ida, he could not view its collapse with indifference. While they were still talking, the dressing bell rang, and Harold rose to go. Stop and dine, won't you, Quaritch? said the squire. Harold hesitated and looked at Ida. She made no movement, but her eyes said stay, and he sighed and yielded. Dinner was rather a melancholy feast, for the squire was preoccupied with his own thoughts, and Ida had not much to say, while, so far as the colonel was concerned, the recollection of the tragedy which he had witnessed that afternoon, and of all the dreadful details with which it was accompanied, was not conducive to appetite. As soon as dinner was over, the squire announced that he would walk into Boisingham to inquire how the wounded man was getting on, and shortly afterward he started, leaving his daughter and the colonel alone. They went into the drawing-room and talked about indifferent things. No word of love passed between them, no word indeed that could bear even an affectionate significance, and yet every sentence they said carried a message with it, and was as heavy with unuttered passion as a bee with honey. For they loved each other dearly, and love is a thing that cannot be concealed by lovers from each other. Like the air impalpable, it is like the air surrounding, and to those who breathe it, necessary and real. It was happiness to him merely to sit beside her and hear her speak, and watch the changes of her face, and the lamplight playing upon her hair, and it was happiness to her to know that he was sitting there and watching, for the most beautiful thing about deep affection is its accompanying sense of perfect companionship and rest 
a sense that nothing else in this life can give, and which, like a lifting cloud, reveals a glimpse of the white peaks, of that heavenly peace that we cannot hope to tread in our stormy journey through the world. And so the evening wore away till at last they heard the squire's loud voice talking to somebody outside. Presently he entered. How is he? asked Harold. Will he live? They cannot say, was the answer. But two great doctors have been telegraphed for from London and will be down tomorrow. End of chapter 30